Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Susan, do you cheat on me? I asked my wife of 10 years. How can you ask such a question, Ron? She replied with a puzzled expression on her face. We were sitting in our living room Sunday afternoon after dinner, having coffee. Susan is a pretty woman, blonde hair, blue eyes, and a Venus type of body. Her usual smile is captivating, and I am very much in love with her. But now her smile was forced, and I could see she was very worried about my question. Who wouldn't be if the spouse, out of the blue, popped such a question? I cannot give you one single reason for asking this question, but during the last few months I have started to feel that all is not as it should be. Are there any reasons for me to be worried, Susan? No, Ron, not at all. But please you need to explain why you were at unease. It's better for both if we get any uncertainties out in the open, so we can straighten them out, don't you agree? She replied. Okay, I said. My job demands that I leave home every third Monday morning, not to return to our home until Friday the week after. That leaves you alone for close to two weeks, all those days and one weekend by yourself. You have a lot of time at your hands, and you therefore have the opportunity. And given the opportunity, it is easy to stray. Please, Ron, do you speak out of your own experience? If I am alone those days and weekends, so are you. I have a greater reason to be worried. I live here in our town where people know me. And if I stray, somebody would tell. You, on the other hand, are all by yourself, away from home, and have plenty of opportunities without being caught. I trust you, so you should trust me. Point taken, Susan. There is a distinct difference, however. You are an attractive, beautiful lady every man would kill for. On the other hand, I'm an insignificant guy, girl never look twice at. But it's not only the opportunity. It's also the change in you. I replied. What do you mean, Ron? How have I changed? She asked. After my two weeks on the road, I spend one week and two weekends with you. I said. Earlier our sex life was fairly normal, with sex once or twice a week, with little or no variety. Now you are much more active and crave sex more or less every day. Do not misunderstand me. I do not complain. I like it. You are inventive. You do oral which you definitely did not accept to do before. So, I start to ask myself, what has happened? Is somebody else teaching you the art of lovemaking? I have certainly not caused the change in you. I had given you up several years ago and settled for the vanilla sex you seem to be content with. Dear Ron, do you want me to stop being inventive? Or is it sufficiently for you to know that girlfriends talk much more than men do, and that we exchange experiences? She replied with a smile. I am guilty of telling my friends about what you wanted, and what I denied you. They called me a prude, and convinced me it would be fun to be inventive in lovemaking. Is that such bad thing? I have found out they were correct. It is fun, and I enjoy the turn our lovemaking has taken. Yes, I enjoy your inventive lovemaking. But if it had been only the opportunity and the increased sexual activity, I would not have been concerned. With all your time available, I find it strange that you do not have a lot of interest to occupy you. You don't have ambition to learn new things, taking courses, or do any job, even part-time. And then you seem to have extra money to spend on dresses and lingerie you never wear when we go out together. I just don't get it. I replied, Ron, you are not fair. I take care of the house and the children. I am a homemaker alone for two weeks at a time, and I have my time fully occupied. As to interest, you know I love dancing, and that I take dance lessons every Monday night. The dresses I have is for the dancing, and having on those I need light and flimsy underwear, so no lines show. The dance school, have an agreement with a local shop so we do not pay full price. And besides that, I am careful with our money, she said with somewhat raised voice. She started to be a bit annoyed by now. Maybe I am unreasonable and not fair. The loads on you being so much alone are perhaps greater than I have understood. I do not want to insinuate that you are lazy and that you do not pull your weight. I should think about finding another job. A job that would keep me more at home. What do you say, Susan? She looked at me a bit surprised and countered. Will you consider to quit the well-paid job to stay more at home? Yes, I said, but it will be less money and we would have to cut some expenses. Would you accept to reduce our spending to a more modest level, Susan? If you insist, I will. But I must I admit I like our lifestyle. Our holidays abroad and skiing in the mountains. So, if you keep your job and trust me, I can cope at home. But it is your decision, Ron. Before we end this conversation, I have one last question for you. One of my friends have seen you on evenings at the convention hotel in evening dress. Dancing and having fun with strange men. He has seen you on several occasions, and he is sure it is you and nobody else. Why are you out late at night in evening dress dancing with strange men, Susan? 
I should have told you, but I have not considered it a big deal. As you know, I take dance lessons. It would be no surprise to you that there is less than one man to four women at the classes on Monday. We therefore have too little practice. At the same time, the hotel has a number of conventions, and most of them has a great unbalance between the sexes. Mostly too many men. The hotel management therefore often invite us to participate after the dinner, so that there can be dancing. We therefore have a lot of free and extra dancing practice to live bands, and I enjoy it. You never take me out dancing, so don't you dare put your foot down on this, Ron. All right, Susan, I can only trust you, as you trust me. If you found me cheating on you, what would you do? Accept my plea for forgiveness? I asked. I don't know, Ron. If it was a long and lasting affair, I would divorce you for sure. If it was a one-night affair, I don't know, I might. It depends about the circumstances, I guess. But you have no free ticket. Be sure of that, Ron. Keep your path clean or else. She replied with a devilish smile. End of discussion. This works both ways, I said. And without waiting for a response continued. Let's go to bed. In the bedroom, I undressed quickly, went to the bathroom and brushed my teeth and jumped to bed waiting for Susan. She as usual took her time, and when she undressed, she stripped like a professional stripper. She was very sensual and teased the whole time. She really put on a show, and she was good. Maybe too good I thought for a moment. She had never acted like this before. She lowered herself down on top of me, kissed me deeply and said in a low whispering voice, I love you so much, Ron. This was good for me as well and I am already looking forward to Friday next week. The night was full of raw passion. Entangled in each other, we drifted off to a blissful sleep. Next day on the road to new sales meetings, I was thinking about last evening and my conversation with Susan. Her answers seemed to be plausible and logic, but her lovemaking later at night gave me a nagging feeling she had an agenda she kept hidden from me. I decided I would use the next two weeks on the road to call a few friends and collect a few favors. And that is exactly what I did. The Dance Academy could tell me that they had no agreement with any boutique for reduced prices on dresses, and they had no agreement with the hotel for the ladies to dance at their conventions. The hotel confirmed this, and also made it clear that a few ladies from town mingled with their conference guests, and they did not like it. They even hinted that they solicited their guests, and went to their rooms and stayed the night. I could not know for sure that Susan was one of these ladies, but I had to find out and get proof. She had lied to me, that was now a certainty. I decided I would ask a couple of my friends Susan did not know to follow her when she went to the conference functions. They would find proof of either her being innocent of infidelity or guilty. They would most likely do so if I just paid for their expenses. With these thoughts I went to bed. It was the last night on this tour. The wake-up calls at 7.30 interrupted my sweet dreams. And as usual with me, getting out of bed is hard. But after a few minutes, I started my morning ritual, first turning on the TV then to the bathroom for a shave and a shower. While in the bathroom, I heard there were news on, but when it dawned upon me that the reporter was out of the ordinary agitated, mentioning fire, the name of our local big hotel, I had to stop shaving and move back to my room to see what in hell was going on. Back in my room, I saw the reporter on the screen, holding his microphone up to a uniformed fireman, in the background our hotel with smoke pouring out from doors, windows, and all conceivable openings, asking, Inspector. What can you tell our viewers about the situation just now? It seems that our men have managed to isolate the fire to the ground floor, he replied, and continued, but we have serious problems with the smoke. All emergency exits and corridors on all floors are filled with smoke. We have managed to evacuate all staff working on the ground and first floor, and some hotel guests who had rooms on the lower floors, but we have many guests trapped in rooms higher up in the building. Have you any information on how many were in the hotel? and how many has been evacuated? The reporter asked. Not exactly, but we have a good idea. The inspector replied. The receptionist was smart enough to bring the guest log with him when he evacuated, and he has also a list of people who was supposed to be working. I have people working on these lists, checking these against people we bring out. According to our latest tally, we have got all 18 employees out and 57 guests of total 116 guests registered. But according to the receptionist, there are from time to time people in the rooms who has not checked in, so we do not have the exact number. The reporter spoke into the mic again. How do you plan to bring out the remainder of the quests? We are through loudspeakers instructing the guests to soak towels in water and lay them against the gap under the doors to prevent smoke getting into their rooms, and we hope to clear the corridors of smoke soon. 
But in the meantime, we are evacuating by using the telescopic ladders on the fire engines as far up as we can reach. But we cannot reach higher than the sixth floor. He replied, and he turned towards the hotel and pointed and said, like this. And the cameraman moved the camera to take in a fireman on top of the ladder receiving a woman that was handed out a window on the sixth floor. The fireman took the woman and started to climb down, holding her in a fireman's grip, followed by her man climbing down by himself. The camera followed the fireman while he climbed down the ladder and zoomed little by little in on them. When they reached the ground he sat the woman down, she straightened herself, and looked directly in the direction of the camera, as the camera zoomed in and her face filled the screen. I didn't believe what I saw. My heart skipped a couple beat as I suddenly realized that I saw the beautiful face of Susan, my wife. I closed my eyes, not wanting to believe what I saw, and opened them again, but she was still there. The camera returned to the reporter, but I sat there as in trance and cannot remember what was said. I had a still picture of my wife fixed in my head. My lovely Susan just carried out from a stranger's hotel room, in an evening dress at 8 o'clock in the morning. It slowly dawned on me that I had the proof I did not want, with millions of witnesses, and sadly had to admit that my marriage was over. Did I leave for home immediately? No. There was nothing there for me. I concentrated on my sales meetings and decided to head home once it is over. A week later, I returned home. Susan gave me a warm welcome, a big one-sided hug, and an attempt to kiss me. I shrugged her off. I walked in and went straight to my bedroom, changed my clothes, and came out at the dinner table. I poured a large one from my tall whiskey bottle, sat down right in front of my wife and asked, Explain. She looked at me with a confused look and questioned, What is to be explained? The hotel, the fire, the sixth floor. She lowered her eyes. Was it just one time or was it a long-term professional endeavor? Before you speak, the Dance Academy does not have any agreement with any boutique. The hotel does not involve itself in arranging women for their guests. In fact, they don't want them there. So, think of any other story that you have not cooked. I sip my drink. She muttered, I can explain. I am all ears. Go ahead. I said, your salary was not enough. Not enough for what? For food? For the bills? For your clothes? Not enough for what? Okay, let's consider my salary is not enough. I am sorry to interrupt. Please continue. Tears started rolling down her face. Your salary was not enough for me to wear good clothes, and I wanted to have the good things in life. So, so. So, you became a hooker. Simple, isn't it? I added. Imagine if I started thinking the same and became a hitman for hire. Will that be fine? How proud will my son be at his school? Hey, everyone, my dad is a hitman and mom a hooker. That would be some weird Hollywood movie family. I taunted her with a sinister smile. Did you even consider the actual cost of your actions? Did you even think as to what will it cost in the long run? Did you even think what will your husband think of you? How will you present yourself as an ideal mother in front of your son? Let me answer that for you in case your throat is choked. You did not think. Does it mean you will get away with this? Let me answer that as well. No. I opened my bag and handed her the divorce papers. She started crying by now and was shaking. I will do anything please don't leave me. Punish me but don't leave me. She cried. You have already punished me for no fault of my own. You left me for money. You slept with other men. I don't even know how many times and how many men have slept with you. So, no we cannot continue as husband and wife, not in this life. Besides there are no free tickets. Now before I lose my shit and extract medieval justice on you, better pack your bag and leave. I have nothing else to discuss. I gave her no choice and made sure she leaves. The divorce was simple. She was branded as a cheating wife but it was costly. I lost my house, half of my savings. Only good thing was that I was with my son. The court did not find her as a suitable and financially stable guardian and decided to give me the custody. Losing the house and the money did put a huge dent on my pocket but not as large as what my ex-wife had put on my life. I never found the other guy or the guys who slept with my wife. I guess they were just mere travelers looking to satisfy the temporary itch. The root of all evil was the dance academy. It was running a racket under the guise of dance. It was shut down. A jilted husband also burnt the building down when he caught his wife involved. I have devoted my life bringing up my son, and my only lesson to him would be to get an ironclad prenup agreement when he gets married. Dear listener, if you have reached this far please click on the subscribe button. It will be a great help.